Megan Palatsky on neurodiversity in the workplace. La neurodiversité en milieu de travail. Megan Palatsky was formally identified as autistic on May 19th, 2021 at 31 years old. Since then, she has become a passionate advocate and public speaker for autism education and acceptance. She focuses her advocacy efforts on quality of life and supports for autistic adults. She also advocates for employment inclusion for all neurodiverse individuals. To date, Megan has been featured in a CBC article and on CBC's The Current Radio Show, where she discussed her personal experience with late identification and autism assessments. She is a proud member of the Autism Alliance of Canada and is working with their Disability Policy Working Group. The group is working toward initiatives to support inclusive employment for autistics within Canada. Megan will also be co-authoring a peer-reviewed study focusing on autistic work experiences. In her spare time, Megan enjoys cross-stitching, bird-watching, and spending time with her family and three cats. Megan Pulatsky a été officiellement déclarée autiste le 19 mai 2021, à l'âge de 31 ans. Depuis, elle est devenue une défenseure de l'autisme pour l'éducation et l'acceptation et oratrice. Elle concentre ses efforts sur la qualité de vie et le soutien aux adultes autistes. Elle défend également l'inclusion professionnelle pour toute personne neurodivergente. Jusqu'à maintenant, Megan a été présentée dans un article de CBC et à l'émission The Current sur CBC, où elle a parlé de son expérience personnelle avec l'identification tardive et les évaluations de l'autisme. Elle est fière d'être membre de l'Alliance canadienne de l'autisme et travaille avec son groupe de travail sur les politiques relatives aux besoins particuliers. Le groupe travaille à des initiatives visant à appuyer l'emploi inclusif pour les personnes sur le spectre de l'autisme au Canada. Megan rédigera également une étude évaluée par des pairs en portant sur les expériences de travail de personnes autistes. Dans son temps libre, Megan aime le cross-stitching, observer les oiseaux et passer du temps avec sa famille et ses trois chats. Hello, my name is Megan Palatsky, she, her, and I am an autistic woman living in Sudbury, Ontario. Welcome to the 2022 Awesome Conference hosted by Autism Canada, a conference that brings autistic voices together to share on important topics surrounding the autistic community. Today I am presenting on neurodiversity in the workplace, an integral topic not just in Canada, but also worldwide. Today I would like to begin by acknowledging that I am speaking from Robinson Huron Treaty Territory. The land on which I live and work is the traditional land of the Atikamikshang Anishinaabeg and the Awanapate First Nation. I acknowledge with respect the diverse histories and cultures of all First Nation, Métis, non-status, and Inuit peoples residing in this territory and across Canada. I stand with you in reconciliation and in proclaiming that every child matters. In today's presentation, I'm gonna talk a little bit about myself and why I'm qualified to speak on neurodiversity in the workplace, what neurodiversity actually is, autism and employment and the struggles that we ultimately face, the realities that we face, two major solutions that can be implemented by employers today, and some closing remarks on myself. So first I'll start by talking a little bit about myself and why I'm qualified to speak on neurodiversity in the workplace. I was born and grew up in Sudbury, Ontario. Uh, and as a child, I always felt for some reason that I did not belong. I tried to fit in. Uh, I tried to do different sports different activities that other kids did, tried to watch TV shows and listen to music that other kids did, just in some attempt to try and fit in, but ultimately just never felt like I belonged. I experienced severe bullying in school from grades four through eight and periodically throughout high school. It damaged my self-esteem in so many ways. And to this day, I still have some anxiety that I deal with, but in the school setting, I had consistent anxiety surrounding going to school and surrounding my peers. 
After I graduated from high school, I moved on to post-secondary where I did graduate with a degree in psychology from Laurentian University. However, it was not an easy uh, time for me. I battled mental health issues, including anxiety, panic attacks, and depression. I had a difficult time attending classes and was often called out for that by professors, despite my submitting my papers, why was I not in class? And it was because of those, those other issues. I did seek professional assistance for that. I did go to my family doctor who ultimately threw me on pills, uh, antidepressants, and said, you know, this should help. Um, and that was kind of the way for a long time. It wasn't until I was in my 20s that I really started seeing fluctuations in my mood and really started pushing for answers as to why I was struggling so much. Um, in particular, the memories that I have surround being in the workplace, going to different part-time jobs, being unable to keep them. Uh, for whatever reason, I would wake up feeling very anxious, couldn't quite understand why I felt anxious every single day when in, on other days I could go in and, and be fine and work the job as if, as if nothing. It was very strange to me. And it also didn't make sense that I couldn't really pinpoint moods. At times it was like I would be really depressed when I woke up, but if I napped during the day, I would wake up later sort of feeling refreshed and new. And that was something that psychologists and psychiatrists ultimately said, this doesn't make sense. This isn't, this can't be depression. So they initially diagnosed me with bipolar disorder type two. Um, and, and gave me the according medication for that. This was after I had already battled to get a psychiatrist in Sudbury, which can be a year long wait in and of itself. Uh, attending other types of supports for mood disorders, at least in my city, but certainly throughout Canada requires wait times. In Sudbury prior to the pandemic, it was at least a six month wait for that. So you can definitely see the, the issues that exist. Um, and that ultimately played out into my job. When I did finally get a job that I was able to maintain, um, I had this job for approximately six years, um, but I struggled with work attendance. I was very good at my job. I knew how to do my job. I knew you know, all the ins and outs of it, and I was very knowledgeable on it, but I could not attend. And the big reasons behind that were anxiety. And it all ended up boiling up to a point in 2018 where I was ultimately just so suicidal that I did not want to continue anymore. I didn't understand why everybody else in the world could function and go to work and have a life while I was always struggling to, to get there and to be present, why I could never get a promotion, why I was never included in, in outside work activities. Like I just felt something didn't quite add up here. And I thought, if this is seriously gonna be my life, then what's the point? And that was honestly my thought pattern at that point. So it ended up at that point that I was suicidal. And I, you know, I was at a point where I really just didn't know how to move forward anymore. And I think that a lot of people that are autistic and late identify get to that point before things really start making sense. And that's certainly what happened for me. Um, in September of 2019, I met my fiance and at that time, as we were getting to know each other, he shared that his nephew is autistic. And at the time I knew nothing about autism. I knew it existed. I thought it only existed in boys, to be honest, and I knew nothing else about it. So as things were going well, um, and knowing that I would be meeting him in the future, I wanted to learn about autism. I wanted to know how to interact with this child. And I started reading about it, but I felt that when you Google autism, that it was very limited in the information. It was very just, you know, here's a few traits, but it wasn't very clear as to really, what is it? What does it mean to be autistic? And the other question I had at the time was, do women get it? Are women autistic? And that sort of sent me down a bit of a rabbit hole and I ended up reading a book 
on autism in women and girls. And I read that book in approximately September of 2020, in the middle of the pandemic. And I ended up reading that book in a matter of maybe two days, which for me is fast, and was in tears, realizing that I had found myself. This was me. This was the answer. This was why I was struggling, why I wasn't working, why at that time I was on disability. And, and it, it was just the answer. So immediately I booked an autism assessment and I was, I'm very fortunate that I have the financial means to do that, but many don't. And because I had that financial means, I could uh, look at private person to do that. And I did uh, that through the Red Pass Center in Toronto. And uh, I booked that, I had it on April, uh, I can't remember the exact day, but it was in April 2021 that I had my assessment. And on May 19th, I found out that I am indeed autistic. So on that day, it was a very emotional day and it was a very um, fulfilling day. It, it finally answered all the questions that I had about myself. And since that time, things have finally started to fall into place for me. I resigned from my job after years of facing discrimination in my position with the government of Canada of all places. I resigned. I became an advocate, a public speaker and a writer, uh, all surrounding autism. Um, I in particular speak uh, for education and acceptance surrounding autism with a focus on supports and quality of life for adults as adults are often left out of the conversation. Often the conversation focuses on kids. And while all autistics are certainly valuable, my concern is that those that are adults, once we turn 18 and over, are just left out entirely and that's simply not acceptable. So I advocate surrounding that. I also advocate on the differences in autism that are experienced between women and men. Um, as we all are, I'm sure are aware or are not aware, maybe, um, autism and neurodiversity research on the whole has always focused on men and boys up until very recently. And as a result, we have a gender gap and a generational gap in women and girls being identified as autistic, which leads to the problems that you saw in my life. And that is why I'm so passionate on speaking about that now. And lastly, the other thing I speak about given my struggles that I've had in the workplace is neurodiversity and employment and why that is so important to have and how to get around the barriers that exist for us in employment. Uh, this year I returned to school and I am slowly building a business that will be centering on assisting autistics, especially in Northern Ontario, especially women in uh, obtaining supports and employment, whether it's resume writing, whether it's uh, tips on going through interviews, uh, tips on obtaining accommodations. This is what my business will center around, but it's still a work in progress. Ultimately, though, I am now a happy and thriving autistic adult, which is what I strive for every person to be. So I'm going to get into my presentation and start by talking about what neurodiversity is. So neurodiversity is a term that was coined in 1998 by an Australian sociologist named Judy Singer. Uh, when we look at the word neurodiversity and break it down, neuro simply means nervous system. Uh, in this case, we're referring to the brain and diversity means differences and variety. So for much of the 20th century, century excuse me, and prior, neurodiversity was not recognized. Uh, there was considered to be one correct way of functioning and anything else was wrong or disordered. And this is slowly changing now. Um, it Ultimately, we described it all one way. We said neurotypical, which is the term we used to describe the neuro majority of people. So a, a neuro majority brain would mean a brain that is essentially similar, akin to one another, as it were, um, that that was the only way, that was the correct way. And that anything outside of that is just simply wrong and disordered. Now, I always describe neurodiversity and autism in a similar way. When we look at the world around us and we look at just different ways that biologists have classified things, we wonder why it's so strange to picture that brains could have diversity. If you were to walk into a garden 
and you look at all the varieties of different flowers that exist. So you go into your garden, there might be tulips, there might be roses, there might be daffodils and daisies and all these different flowers. And they're all different in some way, aren't they? They, they have different colors and different buds on them and they might be taller and shorter and all this, but they're all in retrospect the same in some respects. They have a flower bud, they have leaves and they have a stem. So a scientist or a biologist in this case would come in and say, these are flowers, but they're different kinds of flowers. So we classify the daffodil as a daffodil because it's yellow and it's taller than a tulip, which is, let's say, red and a different color, a different size and whatnot. But they're still ultimately the same classification. They're still called flowers because they still have those essential parts in them. And this is done throughout society uh, throughout biology right we do this with trees we do this with dogs we do this with cats and this is not frowned upon it's not seen as different it's not seen as anything wrong is it so why is it so i guess crazy to think that humans could have that same diversity in them that we could have brains that are different i challenge that and I challenge that in anybody's mind to see that difference and to question why it's it's seen as so bad and why we need to fix it when we don't correct these other things. They're just accepted as differences, aren't they? And when we look at neurodiversity, this is this is a non exhaustive list, by the way. Uh, this is sort of what I could fit on the slide. Um, we see all the differences in the human brain that exist. So we see autism, we see ADHD, develop other developmental disabilities, OCD, anxiety, learning disorders, depression, epilepsy, and seizure disorders, personality disorders, Tourette's, bipolar, sensory processing disorders, acquired neurodivergence like PTSD, genetic disorders such as Down syndrome, schizophrenia, other intellectual disabilities. These are all differences of the human brain. And like I said, a non-exhaustive list. Now, today's presentation will center around uh, the neurodiversity that is autism, given that this is a presentation for Autism Canada. Uh, but it's still important to understand neurodiversity as it exists in every single world, workplace worldwide, whether it's disclosed by the employee or not. So I will now talk about autism and employment. And as an adult, one of my biggest struggles has been obtaining and maintaining meaningful employment within Canada specifically. And I am certainly not alone in that. So I'm going to start with a staggering figure. In Canada, autistics are disproportionately excluded with an employment rate of only 14.3%. 14.3% for individuals over 15 years of age. Um, the report cited below, Autism in Canada, Considerations for Future Policy Development. This is a report released, uh, it was released in May of 2022 uh, by the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. Now, I did question the report and I wondered who was behind the report and why I should believe this stat. Not that I did, not that I questioned it, but sort of the other information in there I did question. And I was amazed to find that this was a report that was commissioned by the government of Canada. Uh, and it was commissioned in response to calls from Aut the Autism Alliance of Canada to create what's called a national autism policy or a, a national autism strategy, I should say. This has been pushed since 2007 and we're in 2022. The most the government has sadly done to date is um, passed legislation that just went through Senate that ultimately says mandates the government now to create a, a strategy and a strategy would work on things such as employment, such as support, such as getting assessments. It would be something across Canada, right? So this was commissioned by the government of Canada to understand what is going on, which I respect for that. Um, and in creating this, um, Autistics across Canada were consulted, and in fact, an autistic person was one of the leads in this project. So I thought that was commendable to mention, as um, it, it certainly gives even more credibility to a report such as this. So this is the reality that we are facing, and 
I was not at all shocked, sadly, to see it. So further reality is that autistic individuals are more likely than non-autistic and other disabled adults to be unemployed, underemployed, and overqualified or overeducated relative to job levels. So what that simply means is that we have either unemployed adults that are autistic, underemployed meaning that they're in a job where they could do more, but they're in, say, an entry-level job versus a mid-level or, a, you know, any of those types of jobs because of this, the different struggles that we face. Oftentimes, we are educated well. We go to college, we go to university, and we have the skills to do the job, but quite simply, we're not in an appropriate job that would match that. Now, while this is a Canadian from the same report that I've already cited, it's important to note that this is going on across the world. This is not only isolated in Canada. This is something that in talking to other autistics in Australia, in the United Kingdom, uh, in Germany, in, uh, in the United States, etc. This is going on all over the world. Um, and it's staggering. And it's, it's sad to see this reality as an autistic person who knows that I can work. So why is this the reality? Well, there are two main reasons that I'm going to talk about, and they're the most significant reasons as to why we face these challenges. There are more reasons that may be more individualistic to the situation, but these are the two most, most um, significant reasons. The first and foremost is stigma and discrimination surrounding autism. Um, these are real barriers faced by all autistics throughout society, not just in employment. In employment, we face this in every stage. In hiring, we may not interview well due to our struggles with social cues and body language and making eye contact, so we don't get the job, even though we could meet every single qualification. But because we are simply, quote unquote, not the right fit, we don't get the job. And the other person who interviewed well who may not have the same qualifications does get the job. In the job itself, if we do get it, we may experience sensory overload. So as an example, that could be in an office setting. Uh, we may get overloaded, say, by the lighting, by all the sound going on. And we may require something like maybe remote work. And instead of accommodating, the employer will often see a request like this as an expensive hassle and instead find a way to dismiss us. So, oh, this person's in the probationary period. So you know what? They're not performing well, dismissed. And this is something I've seen commonly. It's illegal to do it, but employers have learned the laws and in turn the loopholes to these laws. And it leads to unemployment and underemployment, as I've mentioned. A national autism strategy of, uh, that, of which we've been calling upon with the Autism Alliance of Canada, of which I'm a member, um, we've been calling since 2007. And here we are, you know, well over 10 years later and still not in production. Something like that, having national um, pushes on this, national um, media campaigns and, and some things of this measure would help to combat this. But unfortunately, it's just not there. It needs to be battled at a federal standpoint to start. When we look at the other, op the other reason, we look at a medical model of disability versus a social model of disability. So what does that mean? Well, I've kind of already gone into this a little bit uh, when we looked at the concept of what neurodiversity is and, and how that wasn't really accepted until recently. So in the medical model, um, differences are believed to arise from psychological, neurological, and or physiological limitations within an individual. There is exactly one right way of functioning and anyone that doesn't fit that has something wrong with them. And in fact, individuals are pathologized and the focus is on fixing the problem. And this transfers directly into employment when we observe disability management programs that are present in the workplace. They don't, these types of programs that are not integrated, they're just disability management programs. They focus on this person has a problem, we need to fix it. Oh, they don't, they don't fit in it, so out. You know, it, it's not about talking and accommodating. In contrast, when we look at the social model of disability, this one states that society causes the disability by placing barriers in the way. 
The condition isn't the disability. It's the attitudes, values, and beliefs within society that cause the disability. And this also transfers directly into employment when we observe integrated disability management programs in contrast. These programs consider differing views and they work with the disabled individual to provide them the most optimal conditions to succeed. For myself as an autistic, I have found that I cannot work in an office environment due to sensory overload that I experience. And an integrated disability model would allow me to work from home, thereby accommodating and removing the social barrier in place, preventing me from being successful in an office work environment. And this is big to point out with so many employers now forcing employees into hybrid and in-office um, work relations post COVID-19. Um, these employers are creating new barriers for disabled employees to battle, which furthers the stigma and the discrimination barriers. And from a business standpoint, it's really not smart as it will bring in a range of workplace grievances and lawsuits challenging the duty to accommodate, which we're gonna explore in just a few slides. There are other models of disability that exist, uh, but these are the two most that are most argued between. And as it stands, the medical model overwhelmingly dominates education systems, health systems, employment systems, and societal systems. If we adopted a social model, I think things would drastically change, uh, but it is a gradual process. Now, in saying all this, I just wanna point out that there are certainly disabilities that exist within being autistic. And I'm not trying to downplay those and saying that a social model would remove that. That is not the case. However, it would remove a number of barriers that do certainly exist. So what do we do about it? How do employers change the situation that is going on today? Well, first step is to adopt IDEA into hiring and retention policies and practices. So human rights legislation, uh, we have this in Canada, it governs both provincially and federally regulated industries. And while the laws may slightly differ, the general overarching, or excuse me, overarching law remains consistent across the country and across provincial and federally regulated industries. These legislations prohibit discrimination in key social areas, such as service providers, so stores, restaurants, hospitals, etc., accommodations, so housing, and employment. And what I was interested to find in uh, a textbook of mine, actually, I'm on employment law. I read this stat and, and was blown away, but it also didn't surprise me. Of the complaints that are filed, human rights related complaints, over 75% of these arise in the workplace, 75%. And that was a 2012 stat, but nonetheless, I still thought it was very relevant to note. And these can be complaints under any prohibited ground. Let me just point that out. Um, so it could have been complaints surrounding religion. It could have been complaints surrounding uh, gender, but it's still important to point that out because um, complaints that have merit can lead to costly and timely legal battles. Even if the battle is successful for the employer, the employer goes to court, the employer battles this, it can still tarnish an employer's reputation and in turn employee morale and the business's performance on the whole, both of which can be difficult to recover from. So why not just get around it entirely by adopting IDEA into all hiring and retention policies and practices? So what is IDEA? Well, IDEA is an acronym. I stands for inclusion, valued, supported, and respected. Diversity, so all differences are present. Equity, all treated fairly and are equally able to participate. And lastly, access, accessibility, any and all abilities. Now, HR professionals are likely familiar with the acronym EDI, but it leaves out a major component in employment, which is accessibility. And accessibility generally occurs through accommodation. When we look at accommodations, accommodations remove barriers by means of making changes that allow a person to fully participate. And the change can vary. It depends on the situation. Um, employers often believe that hiring autistic people or disabled individuals in general is a costly practice, that the cost oh, is, out, is more than the gain ultimately. When in fact, disability management research has proven time and time again that this is an absolute myth. 
Accommodations are generally free or cost very little for businesses to implement. And it's a smart thing to do, especially in a time when we look at jobs being more available. We have more jobs available than people taking them. So why not at this point look at accommodating? Accommodations should be accessible to all, regardless of whether the person is formally identified or self-identifies as autistic. By that I mean um, formally identified meaning they sought an assessment, self-identifying meaning they did not. Now these exist uh, because of barriers that exist to getting assessments. As I've already kind of highlighted previously, um, very briefly, we have people that self-identify because they either cannot afford to get an, um, an assessment, they're on a wait list to get an assessment, uh, or um, they are not near somewhere that can give them an assessment. It really depends on all of these factors. So the autistic community recognizes that people self-identify and that is the reasons why that exists. And to question someone on that is wrong because a person knows themselves better than anyone else. Now, the employer can legally request more information about how to better accommodate an individual, but they cannot request a specific diagnosis or treatment information that breaches privacy and confidentiality. And on a side note, it's truly unnecessary to accommodate any employee regardless of the disability. You don't need to know that information. What you need to know is what the problem is in the workplace and how can we accommodate it to make it more accessible to you. Now, accommodation can prove nonetheless difficult on both sides. The employer needs more information to properly accommodate, but the employee doesn't have a formal diagnosis and may potentially not even have a regular doctor, as is the case with so many people across Canada due to healthcare labor shortages, especially in small communities and on reserves. We have that issue going on. So the solution here is for employers to accommodate by having candid and honest conversations with their employees. That is on the employer to do that. You need to listen to them. This person knows themselves better than anyone else. If they express a need, then listen to what it is and ask them how they accommodate this need in their personal lives. So I already kind of highlighted here on the slide, accommodate during all stages, have an honest conversation, offer supports, follow up at regular intervals in as needed. The accommodation process does not end when the person, uh, when, you, when you properly accommodate them. It, it's also about following up and listen to them. Don't interrupt, don't make assumptions, listen. So for example, if an employee expresses that they find their environment distracting, well, ask them how it's distracting. Is there something you can do as an employee, um, sorry, an, ex an employer to stop that distraction? Or is it something that can't particularly be controlled, such as office environment noise, maybe it's printers, printing, typing, people on their phones. If this is the case, then individualize and ask the employee what they think they need to be successful. Maybe it's moving their workspace, perhaps it's remote work, or perhaps it's as simple as providing noise canceling headphones or allowing the employee to wear their own. A completely free accommodation. Once you agree on an accommodation plan, write it down and agree with the employee on a plan to revisit this in a certain amount of time unless the employee requests this sooner. Accommodation is a process of trial and error. It doesn't end when the person has their accommodation in place. The employer is still required to follow up with the employee regularly and ensure that no new needs arise or that the current accommodation is still sufficient. The duty to, excuse me, the duty to accommodate as this process is referred to is a legal requirement across Canada. The duty exists from when the employer is made aware that a disability is present and is required up to undue hardship. Undue hardship is incredibly difficult to prove, but it namely is cost restraints and health and safety concerns. So if there's a cost matter, it's too costly to implement. Health and safety, meaning whatever the accommodation is, would cause health and safety concerns for the workplace. The duty to accommodate is a process that requires policies and procedures to be present in the workplace to properly achieve it. And employers have the responsibility to ensure this is the case and to get assistance in creating or modifying them as required. Having procedures in place also requires 
training of all management and HR personnel to ensure they recognize the signs of possible disability, whether or not it has been disclosed. Which brings us into the topic of disclosure. How does an employer properly accommodate an employee unwilling to disclose or who may suspect a disability but isn't disclosing as they are not for sure of their own disability? So looking at disclosure, Human rights law states that the employer has a duty to accommodate up to undue hardship the moment that they become aware that a disability exists. By awareness, that could mean straight disclosure. Hi, I'm Megan, I'm autistic. Or a perceived suspected disability. So you see me struggling in going to work and you think, why is that the case? That could be a suspected disability. Now, note that an employee is never required by law to disclose any diagnosis, as I've said. However, the employer must acquire in good faith, and that comes through the management and HR education surrounding disabilities of all kinds, including autism, as well as human rights responsibilities and the duty to accommodate. The training is what allows the perception of a disability to be recognized. Not providing training on these to staff is not a scapegoat. The law has been clear in its rulings that this is not an excuse that removes the employer's obligation under the duty to accommodate legislation. When it comes to accommodation, the employer has the right to ask for more information to assist with accommodation, excluding the diagnosis and the treatment plan. So as an example, an employee is in a customer service based job offering phone services to customers. The employee discloses anxiety from speaking to customers. The employer may wish to clarify this in order to accommodate them. Is it only discussions with customers over the phone or also in person? What about emails and other forms of communication? These questions allow the employer to determine if they can modify job duties or if the employee may require a different job in its entirety. And I'm providing this example as this was my own life experience. Um, as a Government of Canada employee, I started my job in employment insurance working in the call center and I faced severe anxiety with that. So this is just an example. Uh, of a situation that could be faced by many autistic individuals uh, as we do struggle with social interaction. And this was prior to me knowing that I was autistic. So it was difficult to know what would work for me. So one common question that Autism Canada had given me is I did ask for a number of questions that are received uh, quite regularly. Does disclosure automatically make a work environment better? Yes and no. Disclosure allows for more awareness and education for the employer and for others. Disclosure does allow for proper accommodation or should, but unfortunately due to deep-rooted discrimination, disclosure can lead to stigma. That is the reality. And I believe fully in disclosure myself because I believe that if without disclosure, how can I expect an employer to properly accommodate me if they don't understand? I can't assume that they understand. I understand people not wanting to because of the discrimination. I get it, I faced it. But how do we make it better? How do we break that barrier if we don't just disclose it? It's scary and it might lead to problems, yeah. But how do we get past those barriers if we don't disclose? And when is the right time to disclose? Well. Most disclosures happen for one of two reasons, so it really depends. There's no right time to disclose. It depends on the situation. Reason number one, the person might be applying for starting a job. They know they're autistic, as an example, so they disclose it. And secondly, the person experiences difficulty in their current job, so they might disclose at that point. As I said, there's, there's no right time to disclose. It depends on the situation. I would say whenever you feel comfortable is is probably the best time to disclose. And how do we promote that though as a disclosure? As an employer, how do how do I promote that? And that that comes with providing a safe workplace. And using idea is a great way to do that. But it also comes with promoting a positive view of autism. So the second solution, biggest solution educate and promote positive views of autism to employers and employees. Evidence supports the benefits in doing this. A 2019 study uh, was done on autistic individuals working within the IT profession to determine what ultimately led to employment success. 
They applied a framework created in 2018 by one of the authors uh, that claims the organizational interventions mitigating individual barriers, that's a mouthful, framework, <laughs> claims that autistic employees will experience fewer barriers when neurotypical colleagues are knowledgeable about autism and when they have positive attitudes towards autism. And this has been replicated a number of times already. Um, I've seen it now in about three other studies that I have read that this same framework has been replicated and it's been supported. Um, the findings ultimately make sense. Why would I, as an autistic person, want to stay in an environment that's unsupportive of me? I already left an employer of six years for that exact reason. An employer that is supportive of its employees and their needs will see better retention rates, better production rates, and your employees are going to be loyal. Morale and in turn motivation are higher when employees feel heard and supported in their workplace. Autistics will feel safe and will feel supported in disclosing and in unmasking, and unmasking meaning they're being their true autistic selves. But outside of the business side gains to make of this, it's a human right, an employer's responsibility to do this, to promote positive views and educate. And we see this in uh, the Canadian Human Rights Commission's case, Dawson versus Canada Post, 2008. Now, in this case, Michelle Dawson was a autistic employee. She was employed with Canada Post in the late 80s uh, and ultimately left her job in the early 2000s when this complaint was filed. Ms. Dawson uh, was an all around great employee, an autistic employee, but nonetheless, an all around great employee. She did her job. She experienced a breakdown and the employer knowing that she was autistic, stated incorrect things about autism, ultimately said that she was a danger to other people, that this breakdown meant that she, as an autistic person, was a threat to her workplace. And Miss Dawson, of course, disagreed, and I agree with her. She was not a threat. She got help and she sought to change the narrative. She had worked with her employer to have um, professionals come in and educate employees and educate the employer um, about autism. And ultimately, at the end of the day, she ended up the like her job was never the same again because of that poor outlook on what autism actually is. And Canadian Human Rights Commission, Dawson represented herself and she won her case. Uh, the Canadian Human Rights uh, Commission ultimately said in their ruling, an employer has a duty to ensure not only that all employees work in a safe environment, but also that ill perceptions about an employee's condition due to poor or inadequate information about his disability not lead other employees to have negative and ill-founded perceptions about him. And as a result, Ms. Dawson did not want her job back, but it did result in Canada Post having to work with the Canadian Human Rights Commission to create new policies and procedures surrounding accommodations, surrounding human rights in the workplace and autism in the workplace as well. And this is an important landmark case that did make the news at its time because it showcases the employer's responsibility in this. The fact that they promoted a, a, an, excuse me, a, an environment that was simply not supportive and that had ill views, ill perceptions of what autism actually is. And it cost her her job. She left over it. So that is one of the most core reasons, if nothing else, it's the law to promote and educate on positive views of autism. So in closing, I want to thank you so much for your time and for listening to my presentation. If you enjoyed my presentation and you'd like to stay in touch, learn more about me, watch for my upcoming business, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. That's the link there to find me, or you can follow me on Instagram. Thanks so much, guys. Have a wonderful rest of your day.